you could ask what links philosophy and ritual magic. Or you could ask what makes you think they're separate. Vestiges of a Philosophy is a book which traces the relationship between the philosopher, Henri Bergson, and his lesser-known occultist sister, Mina. Mina is remembered, if at all, as the wife of S. L. McGregor Mathers, who was head of the Golden Dawn. This was the semi-Masonic splinter group in which Alistair Crowley learned his trade, whatever that was. The men's names have largely eclipsed Mina's, but not only was she the founding initiate of the Golden Dawn, she was a dramaturge, artist, and head of her own occult order. She is an unfortunately occluded occultist, and John O'Malarkey's book is the first I know of to bring her life and work back out into the light of serious philosophical consideration. Mina Bergson was quite well known during her living years, but her brother Henri was as famous as Albert Einstein. His thinking was hugely influential in areas as diverse as military strategy, music, physics, a whole range of intellectual particles and waves, and this book is an exploration of the interference patterns and resonances which emerge between Henri and Mina, between magic and philosophy, theatre and science. Recall Marcel Proust's point that certain scents, such as tea and biscuits, can cause vivid involuntary memories. Mina Bergson's point is pointier. It's not just that we can have a Proustian in a memory of our childhood by sniffing retro candy. We can go much further. Through focused work on our attention and our surroundings, and with close awareness of the externals and our inner experiences, we can make changes which are not just memories, not just in our heads. And here's the first link to Henri Bergson's work. His Copernican revolution in consciousness holds that, quote, When I remember, I do not reach from the present into the past, but a part of the past, a real part of the real past, extends into my present. This is not some merely subjective set of pictures or scents stored in my head. As John O'Malarkey explains, what has changed here is my attention towards reality. Quote, it distributes my perception in both space and time. Consequently, the agency is twofold, belonging both to me, it's my act of attentional recollection, and also the past from which recollection emanates. End quote. Mina Bergson's theatrical magical practices and Henri Bergson's philosophy are complex. They're highly mobile and impossible to summarize swiftly, but we can give you the basic ticket to get on the Bergson train here. The past is real, just as real as anything else. It's not gone away. Away isn't even a place. It's a gesture to a spatial direction which is relative to you. And one of the things Henri is most opposed to is the overextension of spatial models. The past is not walled off from the lived experience of the present. It's rather that zones we call the past are not registered in our ordinary attention span. Indeed, the whole notion of separate zones or walled off chunks of time is called into question by Henri Bergson's philosophy. Now sure, the clock and the calendar break things down into measurable chunks, but this is like mistaking your shoe size for your foot, and then the walk you go on, or what you can cut up on a fishmonger's block, mistaking that for the life cycle of a wild salmon. Clock time is an end product, it's dead, it's an abstraction. Henri instead develops the idea of duration, the flow of life in the coexistence of present and past, each enfolding the other creatively and imminently. Past and present are, of course, different, but they're not opposites, except at the level of abstract thought. Duration is lived. We can't measure duration in mathematical units. We can't measure duration in mathematical units for similar reasons to why we can't take a knife and butcher up the tides of the Atlantic Ocean. Water images flow through all of Henri Bergson's philosophy, and he insists that this is not just metaphor. And what of Mina Bergson? To understand her importance, we need to say more about her lived practice than we do for Henri. Mina was a major force in one of the most significant cabals in esotericism, the Order of the Golden Dawn. The first thing we have to get over here is some of the ideas and values often associated with words like 
Victorian spiritualism and, of course, esoteric order. It's difficult not to imagine black-cloaked, widow-swindling table tappers selling dodgy photographs of ectoplasm and so forth. And there was plenty of that about. But Mina was a serious artist and researcher. She test-piloted techniques for developing non-ordinary perception and the expansion of consciousness, and she wrote extensively about the results. Mina was the dynamo of the Rites of Isis, performed in Paris in 1899, which was, it was more than just a performance. It was an earnest attempt to use theatre as a transformer for human and extra-human potentials. The creative influence of the Isis movement touched major figures such as W.B. Yeats, Leonore Carrington, Oscar Wilde, and the insistence on a feminine divinity at the core of this new way of understanding the world was of large consequence for gender politics at the time. After years of psychic and legal battles with the roguish Aster Crowley, and after the death of her husband, Mina founded the Alpha et Omega Order. She reinvigorated the role of women in consciousness research in a manner not seen since the female Christian mystics of the late Middle Ages. And perhaps in the tradition of holy anorexia, she willfully starved herself to death in 1928. So, what's Mina got to do with the philosophy of time, matter and memory? Well, plenty. This book will tell you about it. Vestiges of a Philosophy performs much of the principles it describes and develops, and to my way of thinking it's reminiscent of some practices in chaos magic. It structures itself around the Kabbalistic tree of life, or a version thereof, but no belief is needed. You can approach this as a dry-eyed agnostic and read it as sceptical hermeticism. Nobody has to call it magic, you could just as easily call it aesthetic cognitive engineering. One of the main concepts here, though, is important, and that's, that's covariance, covariation. And I don't think it makes sense to call that anything else. We can think of it in musical terms, like relative tempo, or to use Bergson's example, like two trains on parallel tracks. Imagine the two trains are moving at the same speed in the same direction. Under these conditions, the passengers of one train can perceive each other. They can wave hello and make flirtatious or insulting gestures. Communication is possible between them. If the trains were moving in different directions, it would just be a rattle and blur. If they were travelling on tracks far from each other, they wouldn't see each other at all. If Henri Bergson's train example seems like an exception, apply it to how our attention usually dances or doesn't dance with the world. Aligned covariance allows us to interact in what we take to be the most ordinary ways with objects in the room. The world outside our window, the window itself, the distant mountain. These things seem still to us because we're spinning on the surface of the earth at the same time. Quote, immobility is a complex of mobilities. It's not a relationship between substances, between a knower and a known, between an intentional subject and its intended object. End quote. Now, the two trains in Henri's example are separated by space. Try to imagine covariance as taking place in time. Is communication between different dances of time possible, if they covary in some harmonious manner? Well, don't take anyone's word for it. Try it for yourself. Remember that awful drink which made you throw up over a decade ago? and the worst song from that party, that period of time. Supply yourself with those things. Take 15 minutes to explore the sounds, the scents, the tastes. I expect you'll soon find your attention locking onto a very specific train of thoughts and feelings. The past is real. It's not gone anywhere, spatially or otherwise. It's just that the dances of variance and covariance have shuffled our attention away from it. To my mind, and my nose and my rest of the body, there's no doubt that we can engineer or stage manage such ordinary encounters with the extraordinary. And this stage managing of attention to invoke or evoke extended consciousness can be called by many names. One such name is magic, with a C and a K if you wish, at which point people tend to roll their eyes. So let's get over the word magic. That's just one way of talking about that kind of exercise. Even the dullest scientific realist would grant that stillness, what we call stillness, is a special case of motion. 
This is totally uncontroversial in the most mainstream versions of atomic theory, cosmology, and physics. And even if we're unsympathetic to Mina's worldview, her magical worldview, and we insist that a strange woman waving a sword around and distributing watery logic is no basis for a system of thought, most of us, I think, will admit that human attention can be managed, directed, and put to work in the same way that our hands and feet can. It can operate on the world. It can make changes in the world. How much it can do so is a matter for experimentation. As you'd expect from the name Chaos Magic, there are various practices and accounts of what's going on here. Some of these are not ideally lucid, but the main point is that the images and systems and symbols can be cut up and rearranged, which allow other kinds of meanings and experiences to show themselves. The processes are initially and only partially intentional. The whole point is to invite chaos, chance and forces other than human consciousness to have a hand or an ectoplasmic tentacle in the process. This book's not chaotic, but it's written with a left-handed tendency, I feel, well within the bounds of responsible philosophy and academia. So I'm not claiming that the author is consciously engaging in chaos magic, but I don't know. Maybe he's bang at it, but not ready to come out of the magic cabinet just yet. I say this because the book's structure involves a deliberate reordering of elements taken from the Kabbalistic tree of life, mingled with the grades of the Golden Dawn and woven with the philosophy of both Bergson's, plus key themes from various new materialist philosophers. The aim is not to mystify the reader, not at all. It's not in the negative sense of mystify, but it is enchanting. It's a philosophical parallel to the use of dramaturgy in magic or psychotherapy, a means of bringing into focus some things which would otherwise be occluded. In that sense, it's working in a hermetic tradition of philosophy, which is to say a style of thinking which demands that ideas, concepts and philosophies can and should be transformative. I share this view because I'm not sure what the point of writing philosophy is if its words don't cause changes in the world of the thinker and the thinker themselves. As Kalina Gottman said, and I quote, Philosophy makes concepts, it fashions them, but these concepts are pliable. They have histories that zigzag, they encounter other histories and overlap with them. Concepts change the reality of the room, they don't just represent the world, but take part in the world they appear to describe. That's from her book on exceptionalism and schizophrenia, referenced below. I'll leave you with John Malarkey's fine summary of the resonances and covariance between the life and work of Mina and Omri. I mean, this is the ultra-condensed version, and if you want to know more about how and why it's so, why it's important, read the book, think about the implications, it's wonderful. And if it encourages you to try some exercises which are not only intellectual exercises, all the better. I think you'll find it interesting. <laughs>